Come with me and you'll be in a world of pure imagination. Take a look and you'll see into your imagination. We'll begin with a spin traveling in the world of my creation. What we'll see will defy explanation. If you want to view paradise, simply look around and view it. Anything you want to do it, want to change the world, there's nothing to it. I know one zero to compare with your imagination living there you'll be free if you truly wish to be Gentlemen, welcome to the Business Roundtable CEO Innovation Summit. Our first panel on stage today will be ambitious innovation, sustaining U.S. leadership for the next 100 years. Please welcome to the stage panelists Jamie Dimon, Randall Stevenson, Dennis Mullenberg, and moderator Becky Quick. Good afternoon, everybody. It's great to see you all. I just want to let you know, if you'd like to ask a question of the panelists, you're going to get your chance at the end. If you'd like to submit a question, you can do that by going to askbrt.org. There's a card on your seat if you want to check it out, too. But you will get your chance, so uh, we'll let you know as that time approaches. Gentlemen, thank you very much for being here today. It's great to see all of you. Um, what you just saw was this video that tells us a little bit about Innovation Nation. And I would say in the 242 short years that this nation has been on the planet, it has clearly led the way on every aspect of innovation. Our, our big question today is, what do we do to maintain that lead? What do you new, do and what do you need? And uh, Jamie, I think I'd like to start with you. Just ask, are you optimistic about whether we maintain that lead? Yeah, well, the United States is, has these great gifts that we should, we should, we should uh, pray to like every single day. And one of them was schools and innovation, freedom of speech, freedom of religion. So this whole form is 200 B BRT CEOs. Now, if you look at big, co big companies in America, they probably do about 80, like the top two or 3,000, 80% of the R&D. We drive innovation and jobs and growth. A lot of it's sustainable, it's clean. We educate our own people, uh, but we gotta do a better job here. We're, we're falling behind a little bit in AI against China. Uh, we, spend, uh, we spend four times what China spent in R&D in this country 15 years ago. It's about equal today. Uh, we don't do enough. Companies do a lot, but the government can do more. We have to do a better job training our kids, and we have to make infrastructure where it doesn't take 12 years to build a bridge, that we get them done in four years, because infrastructure is also a critical part to having a, a, a very healthy and efficient economy. Hey, Randall, let's jump off on that. Just the idea of what you need to see. I was thinking about the idea that China now has a 2025 plan and a 2030 plan. And we're not sure that our government is going to stay open in a few weeks if we can't come up with some way to fund um, all the different places that are needed in the budget. Um, what do you want to see from government? Uh, you know, there, the government is, the conversations are actually good with the government, and particularly as it relates to our industry, that they're focused on 5G, and they're, they're really concerned that the Chinese are trying to take a leadership position in 5G. And I, I take a lot of comfort in that. I think it's, it's good to hear that. 
But uh, the concern I have is, you know, they're, they're telling U.S. companies, you know, thou shalt. And so U.S. companies are saying, we're all in, we are doing that. But recognize that the rest of the world is not playing by the same rules as the United States companies are. And so the Chinese are having a significant influence around the world. And the idea that the United States, whether it's 5G, whether it's your industry or anything else, that the United States can on its own support all these supply chains in, when the Chinese are doing a very good job of propagating their technology and their capabilities around the world is probably not logical. So what can the government do? I think the government needs to begin to speak to our allies. Our allies need to be aligned with us on this. And uh, we need to be encouraging our allies. I wonder if this is such a big priority for our government, which it is. They're very sincere in this. Why we ever do a trade deal where we don't have these kind of provisions incorporated into a trade deal. What do you mean when you say they're not playing by the same rules? Uh, so, for example, in the United States, none of us use a company that's been in the news a lot lately, Huawei. Yeah. Uh, however, Huawei is pervasively used in Europe, non-China Asia, throughout uh, Latin America, in Canada. And so the idea that the United States can be this island and set global supply chains, those days are long gone. We don't have that luxury anymore. And so we need to get our allies with us on this and all pulling in the same direction. Wasn't Britain today pulling Huawei servers out of some of its massive equipment? Yeah, that was actually encouraging. Yeah. British Telecom said they were going to pull that technology out of their, their infrastructure. Dennis, what, what happens from your perspective on this? Because obviously Boeing is the biggest exporter that we have in this country, so you're dealing with other countries all the time. Well, I think as, as uh, Jamie and, and uh, Randall have said, it's just really important that we have partnership between the government and industry here in the U.S. And, aligned plans on innovation. So export capability is very important to us. As, as I mentioned, uh, aerospace uh, is the biggest trade surplus generator in this country, about an 80 to $90 billion trade surplus per year. Uh, we export about 80% of our commercial airplanes, yet we have 90% of the manufacturing jobs here. So investment in talent is one of those places where we can work together. And I think uh, workforce development, STEM careers, you know, th this country is short about two million STEM workers compared to what we need in industry. That's a place where government and industry could work together. And I think the government can also help enable our investment in innovation through things like tax reform. Mm -hmm. You know, when you think about tax reform that was passed last year, the ripple benefit to our economy is extraordinary. And the biggest thing we're doing with tax reform benefits is we're plowing it back into innovation and R&D. That's creating jobs and it's creating competitive advantage. We, we are fortunate enough to have an incredible job environment today with incredibly low un unemployment, 3.7%, and probably headed down from there. Um, but all three of you have faced the same issue that so many employers have, which is how do you find the people to do the jobs you need, the people who are skilled in those ways? And I think all three of you have really taken a hands-on approach. Maybe you're tired of waiting for them to show up at your door. You're actually getting out there and trying to train yourself. Maybe you can talk a little yeah. bit about some of those efforts. Yeah. So the BRT, again, has a, you get the book of all the things we all do for work skills. So this could be apprenticeships out of high school, it could be trades, it could be community colleges, cert certified technical education. In all case, they go on to college. So it's not like you take one path and that's the end of the path. A lot of this is done locally. So when we talk about government working collaboration, it's also the cities and the states. So some of the impediments for infrastructure, education comes at the city and state level. So we all have microcosms of where we're trying to get these skills STEM, in yep. some places, construction, it's got to be done locally. And the BRT now has a test kitchen of like 11 cities. We're going in with some major BRT companies, working with local civic society like the not-for-profits, uh, the charter schools, and the government, and trying to find a way, how can we massively accelerate getting, returning America to the best education system on the planet, and we're not even close today. We used to have among the best, and we're no longer close. And so a uh, huge effort being made on the part of the company. And in addition to all the training we do ourselves, I would guess you guys spend billions of dollars training your own people. <laughs> yeah, ter tremendous, tremendous amount of investment going on there. And Jamie uh, well stated, uh, the, the BRT together, the, our companies and our supply chains, you know, I know in, in my company's supply chain, 13,000 small businesses here in the U.S. that are part of our supply chain, they all need workers too. So this idea of uh, getting to kids while they're in grade school, right, things like the FIRST Robotics Program, a vocational training, internships. These are things that are paying big dividends. And again, on the tax reform side, day one after tax reform was passed, we announced we're gonna invest $300 million additional in our people, training for the future, 
upskilling for the future, digital jobs for the future. Let's say this is probably one of the most impressive areas when you look at the BRT population in terms of what the BRT companies do to educate their own people. And you said it, a little bit of it is you can't sit around and wait on the government. And so we all have some very specific skill needs that we have. And uh, in a tight labor market, you can't just go out and replace your people. You have to reskill your people. And so there's some incredible activity, as Jamie talked about, going on within the BRT companies. Randall, what's the program? In including made? very green. I mean, this is a lot yeah. of sustainable work. So you go yeah. to the Boeing exhibit over there, they'll yeah. show you a flying car, which is electric <laughs> and very safe, because we're going to be the, some yeah. of the first buyers yeah, of these cars. And, <laughs> Prototypes flying next year, so Jamie Randall, I'll get you guys lined up. Drone pool. Yeah. Next year? <laughs> flying yeah. car? And, and self-driving, basically. Too. Prototypes flying. Autonomous flying vehicles. Electrically powered. When am I going to see them flying around New York City? Not too long. I think it's going to happen before many of us anticipate. This is a real convergence of technology. Autonomous technologies, uh, new innovation, artificial intelligence, control technologies, uh, hybrid electric power systems all combined with the idea of designing a, a sky grid, uh, a regulatory framework that allow this all to be done safely. Right. And you think about urban congestion, uh, two thirds of the world or the, com the country's uh, population living in urban centers over the next 20 years. Urban congestion and in essentially turning highways into three dimensional highways is a big part of that innovative future. And we're gonna start flying vehicles next year. I mean, I, I have a vision of the Jetsons in my head. Is that overdoing it, or is that really what you're? It's even beyond that. Right? So th think about a future where you have this capability to, to fly three-dimensionally in, uh, in, in uh, complex congested airspaces in urban areas, uh, the ability to connect at high-speed flight around the world, two hours between any point, and then eventually we're going to have uh, low Earth orbit space travel will become commonplace. I mean, this sounds amazing, and I there. want it. But at the same time, I, I think about how I don't want drones flying over my head right now because I'm afraid they're going to drop on them. How do you do it safely? You mentioned regulation and doing it with a regulatory Well, one, one of the big things we're working on, and, and you can see it over in our booth here, is something we call SkyGrid. So we've just launched a joint venture with a small company called Spark Cognition, where we're designing that future grid. So think of this as air traffic management for future drone uh, travel. And the idea that you're going to have piloted and unpiloted vehicles in the air at the same time. They have to be able to operate safely and in an integrated way. And uh, this is taking advantage of the new digital technology. 5G is going to play into it as a, Dennis, as a bandwidth capability. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to need a lot of 5G. And uh, uh, this, this is the kind of innovation that's happening in America. Right? It goes back to what Jamie was talking about. This country has an incredible innovation engine. We just need to continue to fuel it. One of the ways, I mean, the, the, the fuel that, that feeds all of this would be capital expenditures, and there's been a lot of focus on that. Randall, uh, AT&T spends more than any other company in America on capital expenditures. And what did you say, $24 billion this 24 year? 24 this year. We announced 23 next year. $23 billion next year. Um, that's ramped up, even though you've for a long time been the, right. the biggest CapEx spender. That's ramped up. And why, why is that? Well, tax reform. I mean, it's real clear uh, when you take... Uh, less of the profitability of companies and allow them to reinvest it, they invest it. And we're seeing that. I think gross fixed investment this year is up 7% year over year. And uh, I, I just think that's really, really important when you think about an innovation machine, infrastructure that Jamie is talking about. Most of the capital spending that we're doing, the increased capital spending, is 5G. It's fiber deployment. It's infrastructure on which all of this new technology runs. And so uh, tax reform, I think, is one of the most powerful catalysts we could have seen for an increased capital investment. Can, can I just yeah. mention, there's so many misconceptions mm -hmm. about tax reform. The world had a 40% tax rate 20 years ago. And over time, the average OECD country, like 27 nations, come down to 20. We stayed at 40. The net result of that is that when people had a choice, often their companies, their headquarters moved overseas. American companies were actually at a disadvantage buying another American company, and thousands of American companies sold out to foreign companies, and trillions of dollars got reinvested overseas. That was the result. Now, that wasn't everyone's choice. If, you did, if you're a US-only company, it didn't make any difference. But that was what happened. People were putting research centers in Vancouver, uh, uh, plants around the world, so now we're competitive. It had an immediate effect. You raise rates. We all took, uh, most of us took wages up to $18 on, uh, for the lower paid people. Most of all get medical and things like that. 
Some people announce new plans and some people announce new R&D, but the real benefit is the cumulative retention of capital reinvested in, in innovations which create growth which is inclusive in the United States for the rest of our lives. The notion that we can have an uncompetitive business tax system and that would be good for the United States is a crazy notion. And the notion that you're going to see all the benefit in one year, it was, it was never meant to be. And of course, some people got the money back and they didn't know what to do with it in the short run, so they bought back stock or paid down some debt. But again, people act like buying back stock is, is, is bad use of capital. No, it's not. You buy back stock, that's a redeployment of capital to a better and higher use. And we have to educate the American public, particularly my Democratic friends, about how that's beneficial for all of America. And it's not a coincidence, to his point, hmm. when you see this capital being redeployed. This country, for the last 20 years, has been stagnant on wage growth. I mean, literally stagnant. We've also been, for the last 10 years, stagnant on productivity. The two go hand in hand. They're not, they're not unassociated. And the idea that all of a sudden you see capital investment begin to move up, and for the first time, we're seeing what? We're seeing productivity move. It's finally moving. And as a result, we're seeing wages move. And so these things are tied together. I think it's been a very powerful impact from all of this. And that ripple effect to small business is very clear, right? As we said, big businesses are helping to drive this capital redeployment. But the ripple effect to our small, our small businesses, our supply chains, is very clear. You know, Boeing is about 140,000 people in our company. Our supply chain here in the U.S. is 2.5 million workers. A lot of these are high-end manufacturing and engineering jobs. That's where the real benefit's going. That's where you're seeing wage growth, you're seeing technology investment. A lot of the manufacturing technology of the future is in these small businesses. That's the benefit of this capital redeployment. When you say you see the ripple effects, you see it how? In that the, those, the, the supply chain starts hiring more, they start ramping they're, up They're production. hiring more, they're ramping up production. Uh, you take, a, again, look at our aerospace industry. Worldwide traffic's growing at six to 7% a year, passenger traffic. That's enabling us to ramp up production here in the U.S. Uh, this year, we're going to build more than 800 commercial airplanes. That's an all-time record. Uh, by the end of the decade, we'll be more than 900 airplanes a year. Uh, that is all being driven into our supply chain. That's where you see the growth. And, and small business confidence is almost at an all-time high, partially because of the regulatory reform and, and more orders coming from companies. And so you're starting to see the, the American animal spirits Consumer, business, and large company, medium-sized company is all very close to all-time highs. Off a little bit, we think most of the trade, but, but all quite good. That's what I was going to say. There, there have been some wobbles in the stock market, uh, today included. If you look at the last couple of months, there's certainly a lot more volatility and the wall well, of worry. It, what's it right now? What's that? What's it at right now? I don't know. Probably 24,755, if I had to guess. But it, if you're looking at these <laughs> <laughs> wobbles that are taking place, I listen to it on a daily basis, this wall of worry. Is it trade? Is it a slowing global economy? Is it the Fed's raising rates too quickly? I know that's short-term stuff, but you can't get away from the short-term when you're trying to build confidence for long-term investment. So how do you do that? I feel like we're trying to talk ourselves into a slowdown. I'll be quite yeah. honest with you. Yeah. you know, every CEO that I've spoken to at the BRT over the last day and a half has talked about, yeah, it's good. I mean, things feel good. But everybody says, but there are clouds on the horizon, right? We had Larry which, Kudlow. Which have always been there. They're always <laughs> been there. Larry Kudlow was in today. He couldn't say enough good things. Christine Lagarde had very positive things to say about the economy. And our view is it looks, it looks really good right now. As long as businesses keep investing, we believe it continues that way. Yeah. And some of these near-term trade matters, you know, they, they're important. They have to be dealt with. And I, I think it's important, you know, the work we're doing with China now and the fact that there's a productive conversation coming out of the G20 summit, I think it's encouraging. But uh, we can't take this near-term uh, volatility and let it distract us from the long-term. Right. These are good long-term investments that we're making. And that's the view we have to have. That's, the, that's what drives growth is that long-term capital strategy. So Dennis talked about flying cars and the grid that's going to be built up against it. Uh, Randall and Jamie, I'd ask you, each, yeah, what are you most excited? A very excited? economic thing, too. I would say the stability built in the system because these companies, none of us invest money and make decisions because of the, you know, the quarter or even next year exactly. or the 2019 yep. is going to grow at 2% or 2.7%. These are, he's going to spend $23 billion regardless. You know, we all have a lot of people to serve. And the stability, if you look at recessions, the larger companies pretty much are very stable and just keep on doing their job and invest for the long run in, in this country and around the world. And I think that's kind of important. Right. Yep. But what's the most exciting thing you're working on? Randall, I guess it's 5G, but tell us a little more specifically what 5G is going to mean. What, from the you, you heard a lot of what it's going to mean, but 5G, that's just, I mean, it's, it's an instantaneous network. It's, it, 
whatever you want, it happens without any latency whatsoever. And so you cannot think about autonomous vehicles, whether, especially yeah. flying vehicles, <laughs> but even autonomous cars, if you don't have connectivity with no latency. I don't know about you, I don't want to be in a car where there's latency and something pulls out in front of the car, all right? You need instantaneous connectivity. And so 5G is what affords that for the first, I've never seen a technology like this that will change, I believe, how the world works, literally. You told me it does a, mo a movie in one second. Yeah, I media download. A movie, yeah, in one second. But it, it, think of everything you do around AI, anything you do. So for us, it's risk, credit, fraud, market underwriting, cyber protection, stuff like that. You can do in that split second what used to take you 20 seconds or, or two minutes or two hours. And because of that, you have a much higher level of protection. So everyone's going to deploy it in one way or another in ways we can't even dream of today. So the, the guys over here will get really upset if I don't point out this is an example of what 5G brings. So this is Magic Leap over here. We asked them to come. We, we're partners with them. And Magic Leap is a, they call it mixed reality. But think about ultimately because of 5G, you don't need to have all the compute, all the power, all the storage in this thing. Ultimately, it's all in the network because it's so powerful. Now you begin to have an augmented reality experience that looks like this pair of glasses rather than a big headset. You know, like some of the things like you see at Facebook, you know, these big old things. It's, what we have over here is the first cut at what this is going to look like, and it's very exciting. It's mixed reality. You're interacting with the world while you're seeing incredible uh, alternative reality, if you will. And the applications are incredible. So that we're taking that technology and bringing it into our factories. So. You see, in our factories today, we have people and robots working together. We have virtual reality with our mechanics so they can assemble the airplanes real time with digital data. And uh, you know, other th exciting things we're working on, the space program. Mm -hmm. the, the nation's space program right now is incredible. We're doing more than we've ever done since the Apollo program. And I'm not sure the whole country knows about it. But we're building a low Earth orbit ecosystem. We're building a CST-100 uh, Starliner that's going to fly uh, next year for the first time. And with NASA, we're building the Space Launch System. It's going to take us back to the moon. We're going to build an orbiting base around the moon, and then we're going to Mars. And the first person that steps on Mars is going to get there on that rocket that we're building today with NASA. This is bigger than the Apollo program and something that can really excite that next generation of talent. I think the CEO ought to be that person. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saving a seat, Randall. <laughs> hey, Jamie, not that the big banks aren't sexy, but yeah. top that. I can't, I can't top that. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> What are you working on that you're but, 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 you know, big bank, I mean, banks. Banks, having a healthy financial system, and that's not, it's not just banks, it's venture capital, private equity, non-banks, shadow banks, is, is a flywheel and spin of what makes a country successful. Mm -hmm. You go to any country that doesn't have it, they're not successful. You go to any country with not successful large companies, they are not successful. So this spin wheel just properly allocates money and ideas and capital, not taking risk, kind of mitigating risk, into all of this. Yep. So these guys raise a tremendous amount of capital in addition to that. But Magic Leap had to get venture capital at one point. All, we bank four million small businesses. They need money, and we're always trying to come up with creative ways to do it. So we started this Entrepreneur of Color Fund. You know, entrepreneur, small business of people, of people of color have a hard time getting money to grow because they don't have this, they have the family, the mortgage to fall back on. Special fund, affordable housing. It's developing economies around the world, city by city, state by state, business by business. That's what the financial system does. And then it, you know, it's a supporting actor in that way yep. to all these folks here. And of course, on the consumer side, you know, we give you bill pay online. You, invest, you can now buy and sell stocks for free mm -hmm. if you have a Chase uh, account, uh, uh, a Sapphire account. And, and regulatory reform, I've been wanting to open a branch in D.C. for 10 years, okay? We, and regulators made it clear they didn't want us to. We now opened our first one in McPherson. It's enormously successful in the short run. We're going to be opening 400 markets around the world, 4,000 direct jobs, 20,000 indirect jobs, and every town we go into, affordable housing, lower middle income uh, uh, mortgages, small business mortgages, mortgages themselves, credit cards, uh, middle market, private bank, client bank, investment bank, and that helps grow the society. And we held our, that was held back by regulators. Why didn't they okay? want to they, 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 they thought you know, banks were taking too much risk or something like that. And I told them very nicely, we already do investment bank. We bank the government. Mm -hmm. We do investment banking, private banking, commercial banking, small business banking, credit card, auto, mortgages. And they said it was too risky to open a retail branch. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way they thought. We now, fortunately, have a new bunch of people in there now. Let, let me ask you guys again. I, I, I alluded to this earlier. But with China with a 2025 plan and a 2030 plan, 
And Jamie, you mentioned that we used to spend four times what the Chinese did, do, did, and now we are spending about equal amounts on AI. How do you address that? What, what happens? Is that government money that has to step in? Is that private-public partnership? How do you come after it? it it's, so R&D, these guys, huge amounts of R&D, all, all companies, and then government being conducive to R&D how they tax it, incentivize it, and how they do it themselves. So the, the space pro, the, the moon program, Apollo, created a huge amount of technology. So there's nothing wrong with the country saying, my schools, my STEM accounting, my businesses, let's have this big part of an agenda. The government does not have to do it all. But they can't, they can't resist it with too many rules and regulations and things that stifle it and stuff like that. The issue with China, is, the complaint about China isn't that they're that they have a policy to grow innovative industries is they want to do it unfairly by stealing IP and by subsidizing state owned enterprises to compete with these guys. That is unfair. And so, you know, that's why you hear the difference between China's 2025 and, you know, having good government R&D policies. It's not just China that's doing that, though. There are, there are other nations, and, and Dennis, you're probably the clearest example on this board of somebody who is competing against subsidized, uh, yeah. government subsidized competitors. You said yourself that we would like to see resolution with these trade talks with China, but is there a point where you want the government to stand up more and say that this is not okay and this is not an even? Well, it's important that we have a level playing field. That's why I said, you know, there, there are some challenges with China that we think do need to be addressed, things around intellectual property, tech transfer, broader issues that ensure a fair playing field, level playing field for the future. And, uh, you know, we love to compete, but we want to compete on a, on a level playing field. Uh, our biggest uh, commercial airplane competitor in Europe, Airbus. Uh, they enjoy government subsidies. Uh, they enjoy an unlevel playing field. And so uh, the U.S. government has an important role to play in helping to make sure that we have a level playing field. And uh, that's continuing to be an important policy for the future. I think another big role the U.S. government can play is year-to-year -year budget stability. So mm -hmm. you know, here in Washington, D.C., the, the fact that year-to-year, -year, we, we just don't have stability. Uh, and I looked through the, the lens of the defense budget as an example. And uh, the fact that we can't do long-term planning because the budget year to year is very volatile, uh, it just doesn't enable smart capital investment. That so makes a, a this is another area where the U.S. government can help by just providing longer-term stable budget lines. Didn't, didn't you tell us that the government probably spends $50 billion extra a year because of that? Yeah. Just defense. There's, there, there's, a good, there's a good deal of inefficiency. Some of it's regulatory reform that's needed, acquisition reform. This idea of doing long-term contracting, multi-year contracting, uh, services contracting, what we call performance-based logistics, the kind of models that we have in the commercial business being applied for defense customers. There are a wealth of ways to drive efficiency in how the, uh, the defense budget's being used. Mm -hmm. And I know the Pentagon is keen to, to jump on those, but we need political support on the Hill as well. I mean, that makes a lot of sense, but I, I think of the practicalities and just the, the system of government that we have, where you're in for two years if you're in the House, you're in for six years if you're a senator, and you're in for four years if you're a president. If you're talking about long-term planning and not being able to change those budgets, you're saying that uh, one administration to the next couldn't change their priorities, and, and that's a, a, a practical system of living in a democracy. Yeah. Uh, how do you... Yeah, I, I, well, that, and that's the political reality we have to deal with, but I think it's also fair to say that if there was a view to a long-term plan mm -hmm. being valuable to the country, and, and regardless of party, right. I think if you, if you get through the political surface, everyone would agree that there's some value to long-term planning. And that doesn't mean you can't reprioritize funds over time, but we can do a lot better job with stability than what we do today. But you know, this issue you're talking about is a huge issue, not just in terms of budgeting and so forth, but just in terms of how industries are regulated. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, we've gotten to a place where I don't think our legislators, if I could be perfectly candid, don't do a very good job of legislating. The legislation they pass is really vague, it's not specific, and so what happens? We've made regulators legislators, and so depending upon who's in office at a particular moment in time and who they put over an agency, the rules just swing back and forth like a pendulum. And you talk about an impediment to long-term capital planning, right. that is probably one of the biggest issues we deal with. And we're actually finding ourselves on things like privacy and so forth, saying, please pass laws so that whoever is president next or whoever is responsible for the regulator next doesn't have this pendulum swing effect. Let's write good laws. The, the, gov the government wasn't built, and there's not a criticism of government, yeah. it wasn't built to deal with the modern age of this kind of speed. And somehow the government's going to have to have like a strategic offsite and decide and reorganize a little bit 
to allow certain things to take place consistent in a way and not, and not make every one of those part of the political battle. And they've done that before. They did that with base closing at one point because it, it just doesn't work. And, you know, of course, the Chinese have a system where it's controlled at the top. They just simply can tell everyone in this room what to do. And you know, most of those people salute and go do it. So we do have to come with a better way. There are experiments on the ground in cities that are doing a great job at this. Mm -hmm. And all of us invest overseas. You know, most of us in, are in lots of other countries. One of the first things you look at in a country is that, consistency of law, consistency of rural law, consistency of regulation, before you put billions of dollars in the country. I, I just think about that, though, and those all are kind of ideas that harken back to a time when there was a lot more bipartisanship in Washington. True. It, it's yeah. hard to see much of anything get past these days, and I just wonder, mm -hmm. in the conversations that you have with legislators, with the administration, What's the feedback you get on, on something like that? Because it sounds like a great idea, it makes common sense, but I'm not sure that it's going to get any traction here. I think my, <laughs> if, if I could wave a magic wand, I would say eliminate the word comprehensive to anything done in Congress, because we always try to do comprehensive things, and you do, do comprehensive things, what do you do? To get legislation passed, you don't get into specifics. You kind of leave it at a high level because we can get people to vote, and then you hand it to a regulator. Here we go again. The regulators are then you know, driving the ebbs and tides of, of how businesses are regulated. So uh, I, I just wish we could get far more specific on what our legislative objectives are and write real laws. All right, we're going to come to uh, the audience for questions in just a moment. So if you have them, go ahead and send them in. Um, what, do you, what do you think the biggest risk is, if, if you had to look at all of these things, that would keep you from your mission or keep the country from its mission in, in terms of what you all are talking about, Innovation Nation? Well, I, I think one of the things that uh, you know, we're spending a lot of time on goes back to this workforce issue and, and the education system, the talent investment. Uh, we, we simply don't have enough STEM workers for the future. And, uh, and the definition of that future talent is, is rapidly changing. You look at the technology disruptions around us from AI to autonomy to robotics to uh, 3D printing. You know, it's, it's changing the nature of STEM career fields. Uh, the manufacturing jobs of the future are vastly different than today's manufacturing jobs. So there's an element of retooling, reskilling, upskilling, as well as training that future pipeline of talent. I think that's a, a dramatic need for our country, and one that, frankly, spans uh, both, uh, both parties. I think it's a place where we could actually come together and do some useful work. And uh, I think that's one of the biggest risks that we face as a business, but also one of the biggest opportunities we have to build the best talent for the future. I, I could not conceivably agree more with Dennis that it's, it's a people issue. All of this is going to be people driven. And uh, I just, uh, I, I get a little frustrated when you think about all the technology that we talk about up here and how every single facet of our society is being uh, just transformed by technology. There's about one place that I can conceive of where technology has really not made a significant impact and it has to make an impact, and that's in education. Mm -hmm. We still educate largely the same way we educated 50 years ago. And the opportunity to change how we educate our young people and how we reskill people is there, but we're going to have to commit to it. Rules are going to have to change in, in, I mean, around how governments handle education and how people are motivated and compensated. James? I think you know, uh, we have this blessed nation of ours, and what's held us back is us. It wasn't the Chinese. It wasn't all these other things. It wasn't. Uh, it was us. It was, and you go through it, we're listening to it. It's bad policy. Again, I'm blaming everyone. I'm not trying to point fingers. We spoke about taxation, impediments to innovation. What we, do, what we, we used to be the best at work skills, and we no longer are number 29 in the OECD yeah. nations. Uh, uh, our, our impediments to infrastructure, uh, our, our, our legal system has become more capricious. And I can go on and on. It was us. It's just bad policy. And so, you know, you can argue the bad policy was partisanship. You can argue it was. Uh, a, a whole bunch of different things, but we'll do fine. But if we got better policy, and then the other one is, I, you know, most of us think that good growth will be inclusive. We'll get wage. Actually, wages are lower and are going up much more now than everything else. You know, so you have low. As a matter of fact, I travel the country. People are complaining about it. But good policy will drive growth and get higher wages to keep, to younger people and retraining uh, middle skilled people who need it. And that's what we need to do. And you know, the BRT tries to play a very positive role in doing what's good for all of America in an inclusive, shared way, and including supporting things like the earned income tax credit, things which can help people at the lower end and get jobs and the dignity of jobs and bring people back into the workforce. 
And you know, we put healthcare in the category too, by the way, so we're, we're trying to work on how we can, 20% of GDP, the rest of the world's a 10, that is gonna become a competitive disadvantage. And so uh, it, it, that, that's an amazing thing, and we have some of the best outcomes, but, but best medicine in the world, but we have equal outcomes to other people in terms of child mortality, uh, longevity, et cetera. And even longevity directly relates to productivity. Sick people, you know, who get sick younger, and whether it's a drug, drug thing, hurt the productivity of all of our businesses. And so uh, there's a lot to do that we should do for ourselves, good policy, and we've got to educate uh, the American public why these things are so important. The initiative, the healthcare initiative that you at J.P. Morgan are working along with Amazon and Berkshire Hathaway, uh, is that something that you would eventually roll out best practices to the BRT? Is that something you're just looking on for yourselves? Yeah, what's, what's your it, that's a long-term thing where we're, we're getting some very smart people. A lot of companies are already doing a lot of this, by the way. Mm -hmm. Looking at all the issues, end of life, you know, high deductible didn't really work. Like in, in Washington, D.C., a lot of you probably had blood tests or MRIs. You have no idea what they cost. And the variation is sometimes 500%. And so the lack of transparency, lack of information, wellness programs, obesity, someone estimates cost the country a trillion dollars a year, and obesity drives heart disease, lung, uh, uh, cancer, diabetes, depression, stroke. Uh, and we know wellness programs work. And how can we get policies that get more wellness programs working for Americans and nutrition? Like maybe we should teach nutrition in high school. You know, and some very basic stuff. So it's a long-term thing. It's not meant for the three of us. You know, initially it'll be us, it'll be open to everybody. We're hoping that as we learn things, we're gonna share with the whole world. All right, let's uh, get to some questions from the audience. And uh, I didn't pick these, but Jamie, the 2020 presidential election is right around the corner. Is an innovation policy agenda something that 2020 presidential candidates should be focused on? Absolutely. You wanna expand on that? <laughs> <laughs> That's why we're here. <laughs> Absolutely, it should be focused on. And yeah. You think it will be? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and we're going to do everything we can to make sure it is. <laughs> Dennis, will humanity someday be a multi-planetary species? What are the chances of colonizing another planet someday? And do you think a human mission to Mars is possible in our lifetime? Absolutely. Are you going? <laughs> <laughs> will the Boeing, re copying in. Will the Boeing relocation <laughs> plan cover that? Yeah. <laughs> By then it will. Uh, but yeah, it, and this, this is not, uh, not going to take a long, long time, right? This is something that's happening now. As I said, we're, we're building that uh, space launch system today. Uh, we're going to be uh, doing first launch, test launches here over the next couple of years. We're going back to the moon. We're going to establish a permanent presence on the moon. So this is much different than Apollo. And uh, the administration, NASA, we're very focused on getting that done. Set up a permanent presence on the moon. We will colonize the moon. We'll set up operations there. We're going to build an orbiting uh, lunar gateway. Think of that as a low gravity launch point to assemble additional space vehicles that will then hop to Mars. And we will colonize Mars. We will put people on Mars. And I'm confident that's going to happen, I'd say, before I finish my Boeing career. Really? Yeah. If we send them to Mars, can they come back? Or once you're there, you're there? We only, get, we only go to Mars on round trips. Yeah. yeah. Would you go? I would. Really? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. When he puts his foot down, he's going to say, this is one giant leap for mankind but one, only one little step for Dennis Muhlenberg. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, and it's, uh, you know, low Earth orbit in particular is, is gonna quickly, quickly uh, build into a, a viable ecosystem. Uh, we're building uh, vehicles, uh, ours Starliner, as I mentioned earlier, other companies are working on destinations in space, space hotels, space tourism, space manufacturing. Uh, this idea of 3D printing can be done more effectively in a low gravity environment. So a lot of economic reasons to be operating in low Earth orbit. And it's, that ecosystem over the next decade is going to become commonplace. And I mean, it's, it's, it, it's such a stretch when they can't launch people properly, properly to the International Space Station at this point. And that's that's yeah. why the, the country is investing in that next generation launch capability. Yeah. Right? Again, that's something that, frankly, we've allowed to wither over a couple of decades. And now the re-energization of our, our space program, investing in launch, investing in these capabilities, it's going to create economic value. It's going to create new economic opportunities in space. But even more importantly is the technology and, and uh, people uh, ripple benefit. Jamie mentioned earlier the technology ripple from the Apollo program. Mm -hmm. What we're doing now is going to benefit multiple industri industrial sectors. And uh, nothing inspires that next generation talent more than to say I can go work on that next generation space vehicle. Oh. All right, Randall, this one's for you. Oh, wait a second. It went away. Make it come back. 
Oh, here it is. Uh, Randall, lots of people are warning that China will win the race to 5G. Are they outperforming the United States in 5G deployment? No, they're not. Uh, the U.S. is definitely ahead. We have a very nice lead right now. We are, in the U.S., we're deploying. We're actually bringing markets up. We'll have 12 markets up by end of year this year. Verizon has a number of markets that they're bringing up. China is doing tests today. However, China has declared this a focus area for their country. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have said this is an area they want to be involved in. They have been involved in the standard setting process around 5G like we have never seen the Chinese involved before. And this is why I was in the very beginning talking about why I think it's really important if our, we as a country believe this is a high priority for us, that we establish a lead here, that we make sure that our supply chains are secure. It's networking. Yeah. So security is going to be everything. Think about the stuff Dennis is talking about wanting to do. It's going to require 5G connectivity, secure 5G connectivity. So protecting that and ensuring that our supply chains are li good, viable supply chains. You know, we're doing things like, is all of our silicon made, you know, in the United States? Yes. Is all of our equipment manufactured somewhere that we know where it's being manufactured? Yes. However, guess what? All of the software associated with the equipment that goes into these networks is developed where? China. So you have these weak links that I think we as a country are going to have to deal with. And uh, we're going to have to make this a priority if we want to stay ahead here. It's critical in this area that the United States establish a lead because uh, if we don't, the supply chains will deteriorate and China will, by default, have a lead position in 5G. Is that a, not just a competitive disadvantage? Is that a concern when it comes to security? Absolutely. Absolutely. Very much so. Yeah, and, and I, uh, as you think about how much networking has become critical to everything, I mean, you, what, without networking, your business would be uh, hard to imagine, and then yours yep. as well. And so, so networking is critical, but secure networking is everything. And uh, so from a security standpoint, ensuring a supply chain that we have confidence in is really, really critical. All right, I'm going to ask you one more question uh, for each of you to answer. In terms of measuring our success, with this vision of Innovation America, how will you all judge yourselves and judge us as a nation, let's say five years and 10 years from now? If you are successful, we will see X. If, if you don't have this, then it is not successful. How, what, what kind of measurement standards I, are you I say have? America should still be the innovative leader of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been inclusive. A lot more people have gotten proper jobs and well-paying jobs, a lot of them being STEM and technology. And we'll, be, have, we'll go back to where we know that we don't have this low anemic growth that we, we're back to a more sustainable, higher growth, which is good for all of Americans. Randall? Yeah, I mean, if, the, if, if everything we've talked about here is successful and we execute on it in five years, what should we see? All the great technology and everything you're hearing here, that, to me, that's kind of a byproduct. The, the real important part is, do you see average wages moving up considerably? Do you see full gainful employment? Do you see people qualified to do jobs and roles that they were not qualified to do before? That, to me, is kind of the fundamental reason you do all this, not just for cool technology, but so that you have a vibrant society and a vibrant economy. Dennis? Yep. And the close parallel to that is, is the talent pipeline. So it's a healthy, sustained, vibrant, energized talent pipeline with the right skills for the future. It's what enables all of this. Gentlemen, I want to thank you very much for your time today. And folks, thank you uh, for being with us for this kickoff to what's going to be a very informative and entertaining day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, our next panel on stage will be transitioning innovations from lab to market. Please welcome to the stage panelists Steve Mullenkoff, France Cordova, and Steve Schwartzman, along with moderator Yael Taku. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here today. I'm Yael Taku. I'm a senior partner with McKinsey and Company, where I work with companies to harness innovation and technology for growth. Uh, I'm very excited to be here today to talk about uh, the journey from lab to market. And I have an extraordinary panel uh, here to help me with that. Collectively, they wear multiple hats, from a private firm, investor, academia, government. Uh, before I introduce them, I want to start with some uh, observable facts, three of them, that collectively may be telling us a story. So first, simple fact, R&D spending is going up globally across public and private sectors. Second, this increased R&D is increasingly concentrated in the hands of fewer and fewer global firms. So our, our research shows that the top 10% of global firms have nearly doubled their R&D and uh, intangible investment spend over the past 20 years. Uh, and this leads me to my third point, which is that while the economic profit to those firms has increased, that is almost entirely driven by the increase of scale and capital that they've put in, not due to the returns to that invested capital. The returns themselves have been stagnant or even declining. So taken together, this suggests a more challenging uh, environment for innovation, one that may not simply be solved by spending more, and certainly gets more complicated when we, when we widen the aperture beyond private sector to include other actors here. Um, so what do we do to unlock more potential? After all, we're sitting at the age of great, great discovery, lots to get done, lots to solve, AI, advanced genomics, uh, my kids' favorite plea to me, virtual reality, uh, for Fortnite on the mobile phone, and Steve, if you could just get on that, I'd appreciate it. Uh, lots, to, lots to do. So where do we look to unlock? Uh, do we look to the lab, right? Problems are harder to solve, breakthroughs tougher to find. Uh, innovation just requires more resources than ever before. Do we look to the market? Uh, is it a market issue? You know, with increased competition, uh, once products hit the market, economic benefits are competed away faster than ever before. So if you are a smaller firm and you're making a relatively invest, a risky bet uh, and the reward is not commensurate to that risk, you're gonna, over time, pull back. Uh, or do we look to that journey between lab and market, that treacherous journey from discovery to deployment, where products go to die before they see the light of day. It's been called the valley of death. I could not have picked a less motivational phrase if I tried. Uh, is that valley itself getting steeper? Is it getting more fraught? Does it represent one of the biggest unlocks if we could just ease the path to commercialization? So with me today are three panelists. I could not have picked a better panel to, uh, to help us with these, with these questions. Steve Mollenkopf, the CEO of Qualcomm, who for over three decades has been setting the pace of innovation in the wireless industry. And the race for 5G is, is fast and furious, uh, but Qualcomm just this past week announced that they are powering the first 5G handset to be deployed commercially, uh, a great and timely reminder of their continued leadership in lab to market. France Cordova, the director of the National Science Foundation, which is tasked with keeping the United States on the leading edge of discovery in foundational science and engineering, from astronomy to zoology and all the letters in between. She's an astrophysicist. She is the former president of Purdue University and the former chief scientist to NASA. Last but not least, Steve Schwartzman, the CEO, chairman, co-founder of Blackstone, a leading global asset management firm. He's also a very active philanthropist. So among many of his gifts, the one I'm going to highlight here because of its relevance to us today, is a recent $350 million gift to MIT towards a $1 billion new university named the MIT Stephen A. Schwartzman College of Computing, which among other things aims to uh, cultivate AI scholarship 
in the sciences and interestingly in the humanities as well. Uh, so we'll look to Steve for his insights as an investor, but also for his views uh, on the role of the university uh, in the innovation ecosystem. So welcome. France, I'd love to start with you uh, and just explore this balance between research and commercialization. Um, the NSF funds a tremendous amount of basic research in this country, uh, but you are not by any means in your lab silo. In fact, under your leadership, this administration's leadership, you're increasingly vocal about the importance of taking research and working with researchers to translate to products and services. You have a lot of programs to do so. Can you talk about whether the U.S. has struck the right balance between investing in basic research uh, on one hand and deployment and market application on the other? The, b both are just so important, investing in the basic research and then investing in its translation or movement onto application and to development. And whether we've struck the right balance or not, I'm, I'm not sure. I think it's, it's very important that agencies like the National Science Foundation are investing in long-term uh, basic research. And in addition, we're also funding new approaches to innovation to try to do the translation, as you said, from discovery to deployment, or I call it discovery to delivery to the American people. So we, uh, from our, uh, more than 30 years ago, we started funding the Small Business Innovation Research Program, the SBIR program, and that was, um, that was the first, and now every federal agency funds that. It's just been an extremely successful program and, uh, and funded lots of the industries uh, that are with us today. And from there, we've constantly built on uh, infusing the basic research that we fund into new programs and new kinds of approaches. So the most recent uh, approach that we have to taking discovery to delivery is called the Innovation Core, or i -Core. And this has been so successful in just a few years' time. Nine federal agencies have joined the program and have their own i -Core programs now. And uh, in one state, the state of Ohio, and a country, the country of Ireland. Uh, but this, this is a program that touches young people at, in the university and the, at the graduate level and increasingly at undergraduate level. There are nodes all over the country. And it uh, really teaches them how to become entrepreneurs and how to take the discoveries that they are involved with or perhaps somebody else on their team is involved with and learn what kind of market potential it has. And, um, and they have a lot of education and mentorship also with it. And it's, uh, it's turned out to be an extremely fast way uh, to take uh, discovery to innovation. Uh, I think in just six years' time, it's produced more than 500 startup companies. And also, um, it's not just about the startups. It's about the people who didn't waste their time because they realized when they did the market research on their invention that it wasn't going to go anyplace, so they better turn to something else. So, so we look at the whole spectrum from the long-term investment in the basic research, and, but also focused on what can be short-term deliverables and how to achieve innovative new, new ways of actually making that translation happen much faster. And, and Francis, I understand that you gave Steve his first paycheck, yes. so to speak, so yes. to speak. So, so in other words, one of the NSF's first programs, right, was to fund NSF, and this is a little bit of what happens when you grow up. So it's a terrific poster child, uh, right? Not 1985, Qualcomm was in our first round of SBIR funded programs, and you did good. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Happy graduation. That was a little bit before my time. But yes, I'm very, yes. very thankful uh, that it happened. Actually. So let me take you back there, actually. Not all the way back there, but in the days of CDMA, yep. uh, you know, Qualcomm set the standards. And it's easy to lead in a market where you set the standards. In 4G and 5G world, Qualcomm's not in a position to do that, and yet you're still often first to market. How do you do it? Well, I think one of the things to remember, and it sort of goes along with your, your opening comments, the, the complexity of the problems are larger. That's one of the reasons why the R&D is larger, if you look at just raw dollars. The, the, the small complexity problems largely are not, they're done. So now what we're dealing is we're trying to deal with these huge issues. I mean, in, in the early days, for example, of Qualcomm, it was how do we get people to communicate with each other? Then that was really the 3G. How do we do it efficiently? And we, we of course, did that. 
Then the question was, how do we put a connected computer in your pocket? There was a lot of technology in addition to just the connectivity that had to happen to make the computer small enough to get it in your, in your pocket. Now the problems are, uh, how do you connect everything in the world securely? And then what are the industries that have to be created? So the scale has grown um, dramatically. Now what's, what's happened, in the answer to your question, is that um, the number of companies, though, that are working in individual areas are now smaller. So for example, in our industry, we actually view Today, we probably carry more water in the standards bodies than we did back in the 3G days because there were fewer companies doing it and the R&D intensity is higher. So you'll see it's actually more concentrated. So the stakes of getting it wrong, of course, the, hopefully the rewards of getting it right are higher. Um, but, but largely what you're seeing is it's a more concentrated R&D world. And so therefore, you actually have as much influence as you've always had. The inventions are still as easy to get commercialized. The difficulty is, how do you scale it, and how do you scale it into industries that are not designed to take the technology? And that's really the challenge of 5G, which I'm sure we'll spend some time talking about. Yeah, yeah. Steve, I want to take this into the investor's world. So how do you, what are the markers you look for when you're investing in a new innovation? And how do you get the confidence in a company's ability both to birth it, but to also deliver it to the, to the market? Well, we, 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 we do innovation ourselves, so we make that decision uh, as to what do we want to do. In our case, because we're a financial company, it's mostly in software. Yeah. And what problems do we want to tackle? Uh, what do we think the payback is? Uh, and um, it always uh, costs more, takes longer. It's a lot like you know, renovating your house. Uh, and what we've learned that a terrific model uh, for that type of investing uh, is, is to bring it pretty far along uh, to where it's basically working and, and then go to customers, people who compete with us in this case, uh, and, and sell them an interest in it, helps them become a large customer, but we basically turn it into a company. Mm. Uh, and then as we expand it, what would have been just an expense for us to develop something becomes a profit center. Uh, and that model we've done sort of repeatedly. You've done uh, okay. And, and it's, it's pretty neat. We, we get the best technology in our industry. Uh, we use it for a while, then we in effect, you know, sort of sell it to other people. And then we together usually sell it out to some other firm uh, and everybody's a winner. Uh, so, so that kind of model is good. On the other hand, we have, you know, somewhere at you know, any point in time, uh, companies that we own with about $125 billion of revenue, 500,000 people, and we're, so technology is a big part of our life. Uh, but unlike Steve, for the most part, technology can do you a lot of damage. Uh, because you're, you're going along normally and all of a sudden something pops out of the birthday cake, really <laughs> upsets either you know, your business model or you know, puts a hole in a piece of it. Uh, and, and, and so what we've learned uh, is we have to be alert to everything uh, that's, that's going on. And if you're not, you could be doing something you think is perfectly reasonable and, and find out that you've just dug yourself into a, a deep hole. So, so in answer to the question on a limited basis, what we have to do is when something comes out, we have to see how good is it? Is it sustainable? Are the people good enough? Do they have enough capital so the thing's going to be around? And in some cases, we adopt it. In some cases, we let it go by uh, and see what happens. And what kind of leash do you give your companies on innovation? I mean, we hear a lot about companies saying, look, there's just undue pressure because of capital markets and, you know, and pressure for earnings. And you know, some markets, some companies get a, seem to get a longer leash, take some of the tech companies, and others that are more R&D intensive may not have that luxury. How, how do you talk to your companies, and how, what's your philosophy on that? I, I, I know I, I, I must seem very old-fashioned on this stuff. But if you have something you think is a terrific opportunity, you, you should just pursue it. Uh, and if it's not, don't and pursue it as long as you have to, as long as you have a giant-sized market and you think you have something special. Because when you win in that game, you really win big. 
Steve, can you take that medicine? So if you see something special, just do it? Yeah, we You're have a public company. So actually, um, it's very similar. We, 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 if you look at when we've gotten the best returns uh, or, or created the most value, it's when we've done something that didn't exist before, right. where, where um, the risk is, did I get it in the wrong year versus this is going to create a lot of value for somebody. And that's why you tend to see, for us, for example, we're always focused on what is the next big generational change in wireless. Because we bet on the technology change, we don't bet on the particular market structure, for example. And you know, we've been fortunate enough to have enough of those around in the areas that we have expertise uh, to pursue them. But, but absolutely, if you're, if you're investing into a market that doesn't exist, and again, it's a giant market, you, you just pursue it with a lot of aggression. You don't have that short-termism, that pressure. You somehow you, manage you, through that. You do, but, but really, I think successful organizations are driven by the opportunity as opposed to what happens if we get this wrong. It's, 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 the, it's sort of the stress of this could be big and we, we don't want to miss it is, is really the part that makes people excited. And I would argue that the reason why you have those opportunities to look at and decide is because we invest in very smart people and take risks on their ideas. Yeah. And uh, I mean, look at 3D additive, uh, uh, 3D printing additive manufacturing. We, uh, NSF funded the very first grant on that. Yep. When, when everybody just said, this, this is crazy stuff. And they, it, was, it started out as mathematical modeling and then putting the layers on and everything. And then it's, it's grown into its various forms and, and developed into small companies and then larger companies and all. And the same thing with search engines. I mean, we were funding search engine uh, development before Google was a household name. But so I, I think this really ties the work that we all do together very nicely, that in order to be able to review these ideas, and as Steve was saying over here, really click on them, really invest in them, you, you have to be able to generate those ideas in the first place. And that really devolves to the, the people that have these ideas and, and uh, recognizing that this may be high risk, but it may also be high reward. So can friends, I, I want I'm sorry, can I just add, I, I, I think also one of the things to be, not to be lost is the, sometimes the ideas don't, don't win, but the people that you create are tremendously valuable. So for example, there were, there were things that NSF did and DARPA did that created core competency in teams that we were able to hire, and then 10 years later, you need that technology to drive 5G. Mm. For example, there was a lot of antenna work that was done right. that we would not have commercially viable millimeter wave products in a year from now unless that work was done. 20 years ago, we created that expertise in universities as a result of, of funding. And that's, we're basing huge amounts of, of, uh, of economic value in the company or the country based off of that. So it's, it's don't forget about the people that are created as well. Yeah. So, so go with that for a sec. So if we flash forward, in 20 years, who is going to be sitting in Steve's chair? Who is the next Qualcomm that you're funding today? Ideas super upstream that are going to turn to a successful company like Qualcomm. Uh, you want to know their names right yeah, now? Yeah, I'm going to write them down. <laughs> we, uh, we're constantly expanding the universe of the people that we fund. Um, and uh, you know, interestingly, the, I think the most important thing is that we, we reach out to everyone. And that's, I think, a real difference today, that we, um, we had enough great ideas coming out of the universities and the people that went to them and the people with the faculty uh, in uh, decades ago that we could just fund them. And now we realize that we've left a great, uh, great amount of talent behind. And we're devising new ways to kind of capture that talent within our own country. So we have programs like uh, the INCLUDES program that NSF has. And I was able to announce uh, at the White House two days ago that five other federal agencies have joined that program to broaden participation in STEM, to capture the women and underrepresented minorities and folks from lower socioeconomic levels that have not been able to be a part of STEM and have not been the, able to be creators and inventors and, and the, the company heads that you're talking about for the future, but to reach out and embrace them through a, a lot of different uh, programs. And it's turning out to be a very successful model. And just like SBIR was, and then the i program, 
was em emulated by many other agencies, so is our inclusion program. And I think that that's really relevant to what we're talking about yeah. is to raising uh, the next Steve and Steve. The next Steve and Steve. So I want to turn to the, the dark topic of the valley of death. Can you, friends, comment on how that valley has shifted, has evolved? What, what do you see as the big pitfalls um, in terms of the collaboration, for example, across the various actors that you guys all represent? What, what, what goes wrong? Well, I, I hear so many people saying that they wish that we wouldn't talk about the Valley of Death. They wish we would just close their eyes and it would go away. But it, it is a very real thing. And I, I think, if anything, we, we just know more about it. And we know it's not the same valley for every uh, different type of um, uh, occupation and uh, different types of companies. They all have their own particular uh, valleys with its own characteristics. But it, it is very real that you get to a certain point with your, your pilot programs and your, your pilot hardware and all, and then um, you, you need to have increased capital investment in it. And uh, I think nowadays what's different is that people recognize that so clearly that it's, it's like a bridge is starting to form across that valley and people are trying new approaches, coming at it from the industry side and coming at it from the government side. So we have more programs that uh, where we fund uh, we, we fund industry people to come into the university and work with them, and vice versa. We fund programs that are partnerships for innovation. We fund centers that bring industries and universities together to do research collaborations. Um, we fund um, uh, programs like the, the i program that I mentioned, SBIR, and so on. A whole lot of programs that are on the upstream side. and. And gradually, as those create more startups, they're getting more opportunities to be exposed to investors. Like, um, and, and that's what's nice about the i program. It really looks a lot like the Y Combinator program that we're familiar with. Um, and, uh, and so in investors are realizing that that's where they can come and perhaps you know, help some over that valley of death. Yeah. Recently, I was at UT Austin to give a talk on a new kind of program we have called Convergence Accelerators, which is a program to accelerate research on the future of work and on harnessing the data revolution by bringing together groups from, of uh, uh, faculty and student investigators from all over the country to work in very focused tracks on a very rapid time scale to bring discovery to delivery. And I was uh, treated to a visit with one of our engineering research centers there, which does work on microelectronics for energy usage. And they insist that they have found a way to cross the valley of death through scaling and making their little devices, uh, just making thousands, millions of them, so that they can, that's how they envision crossing this valley of death. So I, I think that we're putting a lot more energy coming at it from both sides of the valley, creating a lot more programs. And um, I, I, I'm very optimistic that we are making gains. But I'd Yeah, optimism? Well, it sounded mixed optimism. Uh, and I, I, I'm in an industry where, where things move very quickly. I mean, you may have noticed the stock market's been doing it this week. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, 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 we have uh, things that we do, both technologically and otherwise, uh, where we see a market, we, we want to get to it very quickly. Uh, these are more, you know, fundamental research can take many, many years uh, for, the, the, you know, innovation uh, and commercialization. We, we try and take much shorter time frames. And, and so, um, you know, we, you know, our, our innovations have a valley of death to the extent that the opportunity moves away. You know, and it doesn't matter what you're doing. If the opportunity is there, it's pretty easy to design things that work uh, relatively quickly. Uh, and, and so you just have to have the, the discipline. And so they're in a different business uh, where, you know, it's, this could be a 10-year run. Uh, and that's hard to finance. It's hard to finance. But in, you know, in a funny way, that's, that's why SoftBank uh, ended up with their vision fund. And, and it's also why um, 
uh, it got to be close to $100 billion. It's like an out-of-body experience in terms of its scale. Why? Uh, Masa uh, just came up with the idea of becoming the capital market uh, for, for technology. So, so, so if the IPO market is sticky, uh, you know, or out of favor, he's just become the market. It's actually sort of brilliant. Uh, forget how it ends up working out or what price you pay for an individual thing. He has replaced the market. And the private market has fed him, even though it's quite lumpy, you know, with uh, two sovereign funds, ha has fed him the money to be the market. So if anybody's got a problem and he thinks it's good, he can just go in, take the next bite, the bite after, the bite after, and all of this is sort of based around an Amazon model where that company was run for, I don't know, 15, 20 years without a profit. I, I don't know from companies without a profit. And, and, and it was accepted. Uh, and the, the, the stock market uh, financed it. One of my friends at Morgan Stanley kept you know, giving him these monster amounts of money. And I kept saying, there's no profit. Well, how can you do this? Well, everybody bought it, and, and now they're the monster uh, of the midway, right? So that model of, I don't have to uh, have a profit, can be financed now. In the old days, mm -hmm. that didn't work too well. Right. And then you have these giant follow-on funds like uh, Vision Fund, and that helps get you through, some people through, this valley of death. Yeah, yeah. And I, what's your valley of death experience? I mean, I, you know, you, you pivoted away from, we were just talking backstage from CDMA to GSM when it uh, was necessary. And uh, that pivot is really hard to do. I mean, you had to swap out your portfolio and shift the cool cats working on the fun stuff to the stuff that wasn't fun to do. What's your experience with the valley? And, and by the way, are we optimistic? Are you optimistic? Well, so we, we probably have the less of the classic you know, issue, we've probably grown our, ourselves out of it, but, but the, the difficulty has been, one, you've, um, where do you go next, and what has enough size, and what is consistent with what you're, what you're good at doing, and for us, we had a couple of times in the, in the history of the company where the big issue was, okay, we need to go into another geography or another ecosystem that we're not in. What do we have to learn in order to go do it? In the case of the GSM, WCMA ecosystem about two decades ago, we had to do that. We had to do it again in LTE. Uh, we're doing it now in 5G, primarily in the channel space, meaning the technology we know how to do. Yeah. But the question is, how do, you, um, how do you scale it so that an industrial company can take it? How, do you, how do, you take it? how do you make it so that a company that's trying to figure out how to do cellular doesn't need to know anything about cellular, but they know that they need to get their things connected to the internet? And that's less of a technical problem and more of a how do I, how do I scale something? How do I create an ecosystem that extends? And that tends to be um, what dominates you know, our, I would say, scaling of technology now uh, versus anything else. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to touch on for a second the, the, academ the academia role. And um, you know, I'm going to tell you guys something backstage. You know, fr remember, France is a former president of Purdue. And she was saying, hey, Steve, you are a university president's dream. Uh, thank you very much for your generous gift. Uh, and, and how phenomenal what you're doing. Can you just tell us what inspires you to do that and what you're trying to get done? Yeah, I, um, I, I'm not a technologist. Um, uh, you know, I'm just sort of a generally educated uh, social science person. And um, uh, I, I live in the real world and I, I see what's going on. I'm on the board of a, 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 a graduate school in China uh, called the Chenhua School of Economic and Management. And on that board, uh, uh, we have uh, a number of really remarkable uh, people from the tech world. You know, we have uh, Jack Ma from Alibaba and Robin Lee from Baidu and Pony Ma from Tencent and Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook and Tim Cook from Apple. So, you know, at least at the last meeting we had five of the 10 biggest market cap uh, companies in the world on this little board. And, um, you know, I was on a bus ride with Jack uh, three years ago and he started talking about AI. I never heard of AI. 
uh, and you know what what was going to happen in the future and what the risks were, you know, for people, uh, the ethical uh, uh, issues and. Um, sort of where he came out and he started telling me where all the other companies and major players came out. So I, I thought this was really fascinating and I, I happened to know a lot of those people. So I would talk to them and everybody had strong views, different views on the, you know, sort of AI for good or AI for maybe not so good for somebody. But they all had a unified view that this, this is a completely transformational uh, technology, and if you put uh, quantum, uh, you know, I don't know whether it's on top of it or alongside it or with it, that you have an application that is the killer app uh, for not just my generation, which will disappear at some some time, but this is like this is like it yeah. for the future. And I started looking at that, and then by accident, because I have this uh, program called Schwarzman Scholars, like the Rhodes Scholars, but we take kids to, to Chenhua, um, that um, I ended up meeting all these university presidents, one of which was uh, Raphael Rafe at uh, MIT, and, and we started talking, and, and um, we became friendly, and I, I said, you know, the US seems to me, based on all my trips to China, I go there a lot, U U.S. is really falling behind on a relative basis from wherever they were five years ago. And money is pouring in. And, it, you know, I started meeting heads of some other countries, and whether they're Canada or France, everybody thinks they're doing something. And, you know, I sort of looked at this and said, what, whatever lead we think we have, we're, we're, we're going to start having it being eaten into. And, and so I was talking to Raphael about it, and he had some ideas and what to do. And I, you know, I didn't think they were that compelling. So we went back to the Skunk Works, and he came out and he said, "What do you think if I doubled my faculty uh, in uh, artificial intelligence and quantum, and we connected it with all the other parts of the university, so we'd be the only AI-enabled uh, university?" And I said. That sounds pretty neat to me. Uh, that sounds good. You're in. I'm I, in. I said, so then you know, you'd be in a really advantageous position. He said, well, that isn't the point. I said, so what's the point? Commercially, you just want to own it and keep it. He said, no, in the knowledge production business, what you want is to spread it around. You, you want to produce more knowledge. And I said, so you're talking about an arms race with the other universities because if you double, you know, I, I'll, I'll spare you the names of the head-to-head -head competitors, they're double, and then knowledge will start doubling, uh, and that'll happen in the developed world for sure, uh, U.S. principally, but other places. He said, yeah, that's what'll happen. So I said, well, so the missing piece then is U.S. government piece, and U.S. government's doing fine, but compared to some other governments, absolute dollars or you know wherever we are being eaten into we need like a major you know sort of sputnik response a moon moonshot and i i said we should do that so i looked at this as not just a a charitable gift to just one institution i looked at this as a you know something that can create you know real change uh, in, in, in the United States, a, a very big, ambitious thing. And, you know, I, uh, you asked me backstage, I guess you did, like, why did you do this? And what did you think? That's what my wife said. What are you doing? Uh, and, you know, because I'm, I'm not a technologist and I didn't go to MIT. So, th so, so let me ask you, because you teed up this question of both intended and unintended consequences, and I've flipped to the uh, audience questions and literally the first three are basically about this. Let me ask this question. At what point in the innovation cycle do we think about the unintended consequences? So do we wait to uh, you know, questions of uh, applications and commercial uses and then leave the lab towards sort of for unfettered innovation? Or do we need to bring those considerations into the lab itself? I, 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 I love your I, I'd piece. like to answer that first, and then you have some smart people do it. Okay. I, I think the, the, the the, the things that can go wrong with this technology, if you will, for the average person are potentially very big. 
and, and you can't let this genie just, just get out of the, you know, the magic lamp. And I think you have to innovate back pretty far and educate people who are doing this kind of work to be thinking about things. And I think you need standards so, so that things just don't, you know, once, once it's out, things are really tough to control. Yeah. So yeah. That, that's sort of my view on this. Yeah. Yeah, Frank. Yes, I, I agree that you have to start early. And universities are, by the way, just great investment, Steve. Just Thank absolutely you. super. And it is a long term investment. <laughs> so, you know, I know you're, you just said you were used to short term uh, investments and getting return. But I this think there's a one, whole pipeline right is, here. Yeah, this all is, the way this to is, gonna, is gonna really last. Yeah, we, we, we do long term ones too. Yeah. So, so, uh, so yeah, having uh, students from the get-go uh, be uh, understanding the consequences of the technologies that they're interested in and having a dialogue around that is something that is, is really good. And a lot of universities actually have infrastructure ways of doing that. They incorporate classes curriculum into their technology centers. I visited one at Arizona State University, a biodesign center, where they actually require every student that is in the design center to take a course that's related to the social and ethical implications of this. And we at NSF believe so strongly in this, just last week we put out a request for proposals that is a combination between our computer and information science and engineering directorate and our social and behavioral economic sciences directorate asking for proposals that look at the ethical considerations around artificial intelligence specifically. So we fund it, we think about it, we, universities are training students in, in it. Uh, it's just uh, very important, but the technology is not gonna stop. Uh, as long as there's the potential to create it, somebody's gonna do it, and we need to be there, but having that ethical framework around it is essential. Steve, I, I would love for you to address this question um, in particular, which I like. China has decided what specific technologies they are investing in over the next 10 years. Should the U.S. be doing the same? Um, they should, but you know, we obviously have a different approach to, uh, to prioritizing. I, you know, I, 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 think, um, I think it's a little bit of a mistake to think that People look at these grand plans, and that's how they do their investments. The marketplace really does drive everywhere. I mean, um, in, in, we spend a lot of time, back, the, the two of us spend a lot of time in China, and uh, we, we, it, it's very market-driven. People are working on the same technologies, and, I, and I'll be honest, the same thing that works in the United States works in China, which is you have to have innovation and things that people need in an area that's a problem that people need to solve, and, and kind of people know what those things are. The approach of, okay, here's a list of things and we need to go do it, uh, tends not to be useful, I think, in terms of organizing the front end of the investment cycle. What is useful is when problems, when there are industries that will develop, but only develop if you have a partnership with, with um, government, that's when it's important to have those plans. So, for example, in your previous question, there are certain problems that, that people don't try to solve because they know if I'm going to go into the healthcare industry, I've got to be a big company, I need to deal with liability, and I need to deal with um, the government in order to get them. But there's huge opportunity there. Now, there are more and more of those opportunities coming because the technology and your life and, and the infrastructure of your life and the infrastructure of business are colliding. And so you need to actually have a combination of, I think, almost no direction at the beginning but there are certain problems where you have to have a partnership between companies and government to make, to make the market even develop. That's a, actually it's a great note to end our discussion on, this partnership, and, and frankly, so well represented by each of you. Thank you for joining us today, and thank you for being here with us. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain in your seats. Our next panel will begin momentarily.
presentation. The good news is we have 40 minutes. The better news is that we have three of the absolute best panelists that I could think of for this to help us. Um, Doug, as the token male on the planet, could I, uh, on the panel, could I start with you? Planet. <laughs> on the planet. That was a Freudian slip. Um, we hear a lot about a skills gap these days, this, this pretty serious imbalance between what companies need and what job candidates are showing up with. Is that skills gap real at Walmart? And if so, what can we do to close it? It, it is real. Um, in our case, we've got around the world 2.2 million people that work for the company. In the U.S., 1.6 million people. And, wow. Um, so we've got all kinds of jobs and all kinds of people that are joining the company. And the first thing that comes to mind when you ask that question is what's happening at store level. And as a company, over the last few years, we've been taking a number of steps to close that gap. One of them is to create training academies around the country in 200 locations. Ivanka came to one recently in Texas where we have classrooms, well-equipped, um, uh, today's state-of-the-art equipment, including VR training, to teach people not only skills related to retail, but soft skills. Um, we're we have an English as a second language program, but we also have things like how to do um, an evaluation, how to, how to interview someone that comes, how to have a difficult conversation if you're a supervisor. So we're teaching them basic skills around retail, but also skills like that. Isn't teaching basic skills kind of the job of the educational system? Yeah, if, they, if they'll do that, we'll go on to do other things. But in the meantime, we've got to help if we need to. And, and as I mentioned to you just a minute ago, I frequently think of the Walmart system as a ladder. Yeah. And we've got an entry level, and we try to create well-spaced rungs on that ladder so that you can climb all the way up to the top of the company. And what are your thoughts about why the educational system is not teeing up great fully prepared candidates for you? I think what Randall said earlier comes to mind. I think um, a lot of change needs to happen everywhere. Change is happening in business, change is happening in government, change has got to happen in the education system. And I think there's an opportunity, given today's technology and the leadership to, that exists in the country, including Ivanka leaning in on this issue, to pivot and get to a place where we can do a better job collaborating between parents, teachers, community college, vocational programs, in addition to two and four year degrees. Ginny, does this all sound right to you? I know you have a particular passion around skills training and retraining. Yes. Actually, the three of us have this passion and have been working on this. And I think it gets to the heart of what you said, which is that in this world of technology, which is going to change 100% of jobs, and you've got to get your head around that. And it does mean two things. We have a large retraining job to do. And as well, you cannot have only one path to success, meaning a bachelor's degree or a graduate degree. And so in our country, we've got to provide ways, which we'll, we can talk about, of how to do this. And, and we've gone pretty far down this path in America of kind of saying there's, there's one path to career success, which is go get a good old fashioned college education. That's right. That's have we right. gone too far down that yeah, path? I think we have gone too far. And I've had a big experience in this in that um, we all have open jobs. There are 7 million open jobs in the country, of which 7 million at least people to apply who don't have the skills. That tells you the answer right there. It also tells you that we've spent $185 billion a year in higher education, and only a third of American working population has a bachelor's degree. Only a third after all that. So one of the things that we've looked at to say, especially with the technology, what about this new idea, originally, and Ivanka knows she's helped a lot. I'm going to pivot back to some legislation she's helped with, which said um, you know, it's not blue collar jobs, it's not white collar jobs. We have this idea of a new collar. So what about high school plus a high school and associate degree, a six year high school, call it that. And just as Doug had mentioned, Ivanka visited theirs. We visited some schools together we've started that were called Pathway to Technology Schools, six year high school. And so you get a high school degree, an associate degree at the same time, and a well above median paying job. And we've all, as employers, got to open up what we're going to hire because we found they can do cybersecurity, they can do design, they can do programming. In, in the middle of the country, my big centers, and I have almost you know, 400,000 people, in the middle of 20% now are these new collar hires that are not university degrees. And so whether it's veterans or out of school, and so this point about that we have got to provide another path for people to have and work in this new era of technology, because everybody will work with technology. And we'll get to this, I hope, a little later. There's a, a big BRT agenda about driving that. But I want to, this one last, to Ivanka. Um, one of the most important things she really helped us do 
there was something called the Perkins Act, one of the very first pieces of legislation we worked on, which said if you're a community college, um, you have got to teach uh, a curriculum that's in demand in the market. And so that probably makes common sense to all of us. And this legislation said, okay, you don't get your funding unless you really do that. So it was legislation that you want your funding, you must teach curriculum aligned with supply and demand. Yeah. And so with her help, really, I, a lot of, we've worked on it years, helped get that over the line. And that all fuels and lathers up to this idea that um, you can actually have, uh, I think we can business public-private partnership to Doug's point, it won't be solved without public-private partnership. You cannot rest this on the government alone uh, to do this. And Ivanka, you and I both have some economics training, I think. We kind of think that markets align supply and demand naturally very, very well. Why is there this big mismatch in this critically important area of education? Well, I think first of all, and, and to echo some of what Doug and, and Ginny said, we are at this moment, this turning point, where there is so much change and it's happening so rapidly that you can't rely on just the federal government or state and local governments or the private sector alone. And we fundamentally have to rethink human potential okay. and rethink it not just K through 12, but this term lifelong learning is almost a cliche that people throw out, but what does it actually mean and how are we actually going to accomplish that? How do we think about and ensure that a third grade student knows how to read, that somebody graduating from a university is graduating with a marketable skill, because we know they'll be graduating with debt in most cases, we have 1.5 trillion of it, and how do we also ensure that there are multiple pathways to family sustaining careers? These alternatives that used to be prioritized in this country and now have somehow been delegitimized in favor of college. Now college is amazing, very important. We wouldn't want to discourage people from doing that when it's right for them. But there are also apprenticeships, there are credentials, there are badges. There are so many opportunities today that are vacant that don't require a college education. And we need to make people aware of the array of options. So, so some of the things we are doing at, at the federal government, obviously championing legislation that helps us accomplish this goal, the reauthorization of Perkins Career and Technical Education, that will benefit 11 million students and workers across the country. And really this needed to happen because we needed to make sure that this money being block granted to the states was being used to um, educate um, students and workers with jobs that are actually in demand within those local communities, so to create a stronger connection between the educators and, and the private sector. We also created something called the National Council for the American Worker, and this is a U.S. government council. It's across 14 different agencies, and it's say, let's come together and come up with a strategic vision for how we think about education at all stages of one's career. Now, the federal government spends a lot of money on worker training program, and truthfully, the best stuff we've seen is not that. It's happening at a state level. <laughs> it's where a governor um, and or a, a local leader teams up with a business, teams up with a community college, they co-develop a curriculum, they teach it to the students, and employ them on the opposite end. So there are a lot of great things happening out on a state level, but what the federal government can do is we can convene, we can create best practices, we can free up data we have so much data that will allow the private sector to come and innovate and bridge that skills gap. Because I think one of the reasons there is a skills gap is because there isn't transparency around job vacancies. So right now, we can tell you that for the first time in history, there are more vacant jobs than people available to fill them. We can tell you what industries they're in based on Bureau of Labor Statistics data. But we can't tell you geographically where they're located. And we can't tell you the underlying skills required to fill them. So, because we just it's don't in have mining that in, and logging. We just but don't what have that, that information mean? right now? That's, well, we're, and we're not, so some of the great examples of what government's done um, in the past is make data available and then the private sector comes in and does what they do best. So a great example of this is all of our weather apps. That's innovation off of government data to specific users based on what their needs are. Yeah. We need to do that around jobs and around skills. Um, so we're really passionate about thinking about how we can leverage government data, how we can encourage private sector large employers to continue contribute their data, create a national schema, create language that is 
um, uniform, so it's searchable. So if somebody has a skill, they can know the 10 other industries that that skill would make them successful in. Okay. That information is not currently available. There's also, I think, a big opportunity, which Ginny touched on, um, in terms of higher education reauthorization, which is coming up next year, and ways that we can um, create um, take away sort of the disincentive to go other routes than four-year college, open up Pell Grants, for example, to people getting dual degrees um, or um, in, in high school or going on to apprenticeship programs. We've um, created industry-wide um, apprenticeship programs at the federal government, um, which we think is a tremendous opportunity, taking the lead of countries like Switzerland and Germany who have done this successfully. And then, and both of your companies have signed it, we've created a pledge um, that is really a private sector pledge. It's called our Pledge to America's Workers. That since we launched it just three months ago, over 6.5 million enhanced career opportunities have been created by the private sector. And this is something, this is a way we can hopefully excite um, the private sector to join us, companies large and small, to invest into their workforce. Because while we hear there are job vacancies, we hear from employers all the time that they don't have workers with the skills they need, but what role are they taking in training those workers, in upskilling those workers, um, and ensuring that they maintain their path in the face of automation? Can I, can I ask um, Ivanka one follow-up question? Yeah. One of the demographic groups that seems to be having the most trouble with this big adjustment that we all agree is happening is essentially mid-career, middle-aged, least educated Americans. We were talking backstage about the people on the sidelines of the economy, just not even looking for jobs anymore. This is the group that is really most on the sidelines. Have you seen green shoots about what, what needs to happen to get those folk off the sidelines? Oh, absolutely. And this is why I'm so passionate about this now, because the economy is so strong. Yeah. Because unemployment is so low, that means that companies are investing in those that are on the sidelines, teaching them the skills. They're investing in those that would otherwise not be given the opportunity. For example, we have 650,000 people come out of our federal and state prisons every year. Okay. Those people would not be given an opportunity if the unemployment rate was at 8%. Yeah. But now they are getting that opportunity. So how can we, um, as part of the step back, First Step Act, which um, we're seeking to have passed um, in, in the coming weeks, how can we think about using our prison system so that we can teach um, those in, in, in custody skills that will allow them to come out, get jobs, um, and have an opportunity. What's fascinating to me is a full one-third of the people who are currently unemployed just were added to the figures of unemployment, meaning they came out they came, of, yeah, exactly. they came into the economy. At least started they came into the for, game. Correct. Yep. They, they had, for whatever reason, stopped looking, and they started looking, and, sure. and that's, Amazing. It's a great phenomenon, right? Should we be worried, for example, about the three million-ish people who drive vehicles for a living in the face of autonomous cars and trucks? Well, this is why we need this combination between the public and the private sector, because the private sector will always know before us which jobs are going to be displaced. And this is why I'm so passionate about creating this national call to action of what is your role? Everyone is, wants to be a good corporate citizen. That's taken on a different level of priority in recent years than it had probably in decades prior. But I view the first place you start is the workforce and your workforce. So what is the role of companies as they're making investment in technology that will also create opportunity? So when you think about what's happening in factories, making work less dangerous by working with robotics is going to enable people um, to be more productive. It's going to um, hopefully decrease the amount of in injuries for, for manual labor. It's going to allow people with disabilities, um, more women to come into the workforce and do jobs that were traditionally male jobs. So there's tremendous opportunity, but we need the feedback from the private sector. And then our job as government, once we convene, is to make sure um, that we're A, raising awareness and B, providing these alternative pathways. And I'm sorry, I interrupted. Yeah, no, I, I wanted to just build on this because in, in this being a, the BRT here coming together and its agenda, 
uh, in the supply and demand here. So one of the things we do really recognize, all of us, that with 100% of jobs changing, this reskilling of America in lifelong learning, what do you do? So there's part of a program we're now um, launching as part of this innovation called, if you take a look, to think of it as being ready, right? So tomorrow ready, a program tomorrow ready, an America that always learns. And where this matches up is that you say, it is a job of all of us to help do that reskilling. And so there are mechanisms, policy things that can be done. Ivanka mentioned the, mentioned the Higher Education Act up for reauthorization. There is $100 billion on loans, there's $30 billion on grants, and then there is work-study programs. Okay. Changes such as, for work-study, allow that to be an apprenticeship out in the marketplace, not working on campus. Which is not the case you know, so now. So not, not working on, no, it is not. Right. You, probably, you have to use that money, almost all but 25% of it, to work on campus. Oh, to sit so in the classroom. So kids are in a cafeteria getting paid, or they're sweeping floors. So that's a work-study funding. Got it. Then when it comes to grants and loans, today you have to be a full-time student um, or it, you've got to be full-time and going to college. Well, instead, what if we use some of that money and broaden the base of where that goes? So, we, we might so you were asking about all those people to be retrained, yeah. Yeah. apprenticeships, badges, credentials, and all that could help quickly go against that. So we couldn't so, be too rigid or too constrained with some I, of what we're I, we We are going to propose, and hopefully with Ivanka's help again and others, to change some of that policy to do it. Because then, then I want to come back to the other part is Doug and you know, all of us in private sector, the demand. So we have to be willing then to hire people from all these walks of life. And so that would mean, it, and I was telling Andrew backstage, I'd done this study as part of um, a cybersecurity uh, study we're hosting as part of the Aspen Institute. And we looked at for the whole country, because everybody needs cybersecurity people. And we took everybody's job applications in the whole country and did the analysis on them. All of us employers are writing down 3x the qualifications than you really need to do those jobs. It, you, you ask for all these credentials, all these years of experience, which frankly are probably almost impossible to fill. So <laughs> there, with, there are seven people in the country and, and so with all those credentials. But it's an example of almost every technology-related job is getting over specced out there. So if we can get employers to say, no, 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 let me write what I really need, and using tools, AI, the person actually can handle that yeah. job. And they don't need that university degree. And therefore, the demand side, us, we need to be willing to hire in those folks. Can you and give us it, any insight as to why employers like yourselves tend to over-credential so much? Oh, it's What's not just on? me, by the way. It's That's all of us. It's all sorry. of us, so just to be clear. Um, <laughs> what, what, like, Doug, if, if you can help, why, why would you do that? Many things technology-related. People often put, you've got to have this kind of degree, this kind of this, this computer science. And when you look around, if every job's going to have tech intermixed with it, um, you're a bank teller, right? You're working in any kind of retail. You actually can get these credentials in other ways. And so I really think it's just, you get to we're all, it's such an important piece of both the employer changing their mindset and then putting these enablers yeah. in the education system one out to, there. One way to think about it is to deconstruct the job itself or the job title and code down to tasks. Yep. And think about where can AI help me or some other form of automation help me and therefore what's left and what are humans best at and how do you pivot them, prepare them and train them to do the things that we are better at. Yeah, got it. I think, um, I think one of the other elements that, that is um, important to consider as part of this conversation is that when you look at the country, there are, there's a real diversity in the poverty that exists and in the opportunity that exists. And I think one of the things that um, we've done through tax reform is not only make our country and our businesses more competitive, um, while on the same time, on the same um, side of the coin, investing in, in working families, but we've also created something um, called opportunity zones. And these are, I think, going to be really transformative because how do you drive investment? How do you drive, how, how do you encourage private sector capital to go to 
urban and rural underserved communities across this country where the unemployment rates are disproportionately high. Yes. So I think once the demand's there, and once the capital's there, and once the businesses are located there, then there'll be the training opportunity, there'll be the employment opportunity. So I actually think that's a big part of the problem as well, that there are certain areas, there are certain geographic areas of this country that have just not had the same access to opportunity, um, and therefore, from a skills perspective, they, they've been left behind. It I've is spent encouraging a lot of to see how tech jobs are starting to spread yeah. out around the company. Absolutely. You're seeing I that as in, well. You can see coding happening in all kinds of places these days. I was in eastern Kentucky recently, and, um, and I met a, a gentleman named Alex. And he was telling me how a couple of years ago, he applied multiple times at local grocery stores to bag groceries and was turned down for a job. Then he took a class in coding. Um, and, and computer science, and now he gets at least one email a week soliciting him to work for their firm, big firms that we know about, computer science firms and, and other firms, um, to, to join their company. And, and he lives in eastern Kentucky, has no interest in moving. Code is exportable, ah. just like coal. So, so just, I think, for, um, for employers also to um, get more creative about um, the talent that exists outside of the country. I think for venture capital um, to leave three quarters of venture capital is located in three states, um, which is crazy. Yep. So how do we encourage um, that capital to invest in, in other communities? And I think opportunity zones will be a major catalyst in terms of spurring that type of investment. And is the White House open to more kinds of place-based, specifically geographically uh, targeted policies? Employment, um, opportunity zones are a great one. There could be wage subsidies well, for workers. Well, there could be entrepreneur visas. I think what's interesting about opportunity zones it is it creates the incentive for the private sector to go to areas that have been overlooked um, rather than us picking and choosing. Um, I think another area that we've been very focused on is, is working family policies that recognize the modern reality where 47% of the workforce is female. Um, in 40% of American households, females are the primary breadwinners, mm -hmm. yet women disproportionately provide um, unpaid care for adult dependents um, and for, for our children. So how do we adapt to that new reality? Because it's actually happened quite quickly over, over recent decades. How do we advance policies like paid leave? And this president was the first who, to put a national paid leave plan in the president's budget every single year. Um, now we're working to build coalitions of, of support for, um, for legislation on that front. As part of tax reform, doubling the child tax credit, recognizing that it's expensive to raise children. Um, and just like in business, if you invest in technology, you write off that expense. Well, what about parents investing in our future workforce? Um, so, so we're between that and then, of course, um, childcare, which is an enormous problem in this country. And the most recent omnibus, we had the single largest expansion of the childcare and development block grants to the states, recognizing that you can't work if you can't afford care. And I heard this from the employees at, at a Walmart, and it's been amazing to see, um, Doug, what you've done in terms of expanding benefits, such as paid leave to, to your workers. Um, but hearing some of the challenges around childcare, childcare access, childcare affordability, that is a real restriction to growth. And so both the private become, sector and public we, sector needs to think about it. We took a portion of the tax savings and lengthened our benefits to 16 weeks for birth moms, parental leave um, up to 10 weeks, and it was one of the most popular things we've done this year. Doug, I had a really interesting experience just a couple weeks ago. I walked into a convenience store, grabbed a couple items off a shelf, walked out of that store, and instead of getting arrested for shoplifting, I got a receipt saying, oh, you bought these, these couple things. Is that the future of retail? Yeah, for sure. There's innovation happening at the front of the store and the middle of the store, the back, and in the supply chain. It's happening in terms of robotics and automation. Um, today at Sam's Club, you can use Scan and Go and do exactly what you just experienced. I didn't even scan. Store. Oh, well, then you may need to be arrested. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just I, I stand here before it you. A, it was probably computer vision. It, it's happening here. It's happening in China. Um, in, in our stores today, in some of our test stores, we've got um, autonomous floor cleaners. Think of an industrial Roomba wandering around the store, and it's got a camera on it. It's looking at all of the features that yeah. we have in the store. Another scanner is running an aisle. They're talking to each other. They're also talking to an unloader in the back where there's a, a camera that's looking at the rollers with the freight coming out of the back of the trailer, and it's sorting. This needs to go to the floor right now. IoT is starting to happen. And as we, as we datafy 
all of the transactions inside the company, not just our transactions with customers, but internal transactions, and then start to apply smarter and smarter, smarter algorithms to that, you're going to see a lot of change happen. 5G, those, those examples, cloud, all of this is coming together to create Those examples you just gave sound to me like labor replacing technologies as opposed to labor augmenting technologies. What am I missing? No, no, it, partially you're right. I think what's happening is I've talked with store associates and DC associates is that those tasks that they didn't enjoy doing very much that were mundane um, or, or difficult in some way, the machines are starting to do them. And people like it. So we're ending up just upgrading them to do things, upskilling them, and that's one of the reasons why we need the academies, is to prepare them to do different kinds of work. So at the same time that's happening, and as cashier counts are coming down, personal shoppers are being created where we pick your grocery order for you. So one of the more popular things we've got right now is grocery pickup, where you can order on your app and schedule a slot, and ah. come through the store and pick it up, we'll put it in your trunk, and, and you take off. Well, already we've created 30,000 jobs for people that are picking orders inside of our stores as they become fulfillment centers. And now delivery's growing, and we hope to use associates to do home deliveries as well. So there'll be a pivot to new kinds of jobs. One I, of I the greatest things that I saw when, um, when I was at a Walmart Academy in Mesquite, Texas, was um, because of the efficiencies that you're talking about that technology has enabled, it actually freed up bandwidth within the footprint of existing stores mm -hmm. that enabled you to create these academies and use that space mm -hmm. to, to upskill your existing workforce and, and really invest in, in, in that workforce for different type of opportunities. Yeah. And, and that's where the soft skills component is so important. Yeah. Conflict resolution. How do you deal with um, a customer when um, tensions are flaring? Um, flaring. There was a, a simulation, which I'm glad I didn't have to experience, but how do you deal with the thanks Giving day bombardment where people are pulling toys off the shelf um, and fighting over like what do you do in a high intensity situation like that so to be able to actually simulate those type of experience um, experiences is, is absolutely amazing so I saw some of the VR technology and I was blown away by it but but I think that's a great example of the continued investment and now that's not called a new job but I actually view that as just as important mm -hmm. um, as creating a new job opportunity, an apprenticeship, um, or going into a high school and giving somebody a pathway right out of high school, but investing in an existing worker um, and giving them a pathway for growth. Ivanka put on VR goggles and stocked a vegetable wall in front of about 100 Walmart. How did she handle the onslaught of Black Friday shoppers? Was she a pro? She was great. Yeah, she, she, yeah we'll, we'll unflappable. Put a badge on her anytime. I took off the mask, <laughs> threw it down, away. and ran. <laughs> Ginny, you know that there, every, every, for the entire industrial era, there has been hand-wringing and worrying about massive unemployment because of technology. Yes. For 200 years, that has been wrong. Yeah. As I've listened to you, you seem confident that that hand-wringing or that worry is going to continue to be wrong, to be misplaced, that we're going to have a more jobs future, even in the face of all this technology. Do I have that right? I do. I do, and I, and I do think that, uh, as, as I've said, there were so many studies, and there are many fear-mongering about this topic, but that in the end, what is true is that 100% of jobs, they will change. Got it. They will change in some way. You were just describing how even the person who does and deals with a customer in the store, what they do is different today. So if you wrap your head around that, it is what makes skills the issue of our time. That's why we keep going back to what we all have to do. And what's different, though, now, and, and we do work with you guys quite a bit as, as Walmart, but the, this speed of how this is happening, ah. it is happening more quickly than in the past, which is what's making the skills a more is, an urgent issue. But it also means something else for these technologies like AI. It is our job to be sure they're brought safely into this world. So I do think, Andrew, there's a, there's a set of things that business owes a responsibility, all business, not just tech, to bring them safely in. So that means, Doug was just describing how a person interacts with the technology. So I think one of the principles you should live by is, our, we believe that these technologies should augment what man does. I mean, I build them, I have a chance to influence that. And so therefore, how I build them, you're right, they're gonna replace things that are common sense, it's gonna be replaced and more. So therefore, it's gonna force each of us to do what man does well. And therefore, I build it that way. So that's purpose. I think it's gonna still bring a light on who owns data, how should it be used, where does the benefit go. I have to be a believer that data it goes and belongs to the owner, and so do the insights. And then the next is something these guys are both alluding to, these technologies, they gotta be explainable so the population trusts them. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that also means, by the way, like AI, it's taught, as you well know, and therefore, it can learn bias. 
<laughs> so it is really important that we have diverse workforces that train these things, that we use tools that make them not bias, or we repeat the sins of our past. A and monoculture so, developing AI is it's a horrible a thing. Idea. It's a it is okay. it really these discussions about getting such a, a inclusive working culture, it is critical to our future. These if building our toys, building our games, building our work, you want diverse workforces, but but my point on that is that you want society to trust these things, right? And so I, I have, I'm one of my best examples, uh, one of the big banks we work with in Europe that uses AI with all their customer service, as many banks and more and more are starting to do. The union is 100% supportive. The union is, right? Now you typically think, oh, that means there's gonna be less jobs. Mm. No, you know what? Everybody wants to do a good job at their work. The customer service people, very complex financial products, all feel they can now do a better job because they have an assistant helping them with the things they're not always sure of. You know, we like to think humans are always right. You know the number. I mean, humans are not right all the time, right? You know, is your doctor, nor is anyone. And so, in fact, a third, a third, a third. And so, people feel so much better about their job. They can get more done. Their when education level. When they're level. backstopped by some good technology. Yes. And so, it, and again, will there be things replaced? Yes. But when I look at the amount of customer service that people can now do a better job at, some can be will be replaced. Absolutely. When I look at healthcare and I watch an oncology, you know, um, diagnosis and treatment be done better, these are really big issues. Yeah. Almost like any important life decision is going to have some of that help in there. And that's how I think you have to think of it as augmenting what we do. And, and I'm an optimist in this regard as I well. I am very much. We just left um, uh, a great working um, group discussion at, at the White House where we could, were talking as, as a collective with, with leaders in, in industry and academia about how we can ensure America's dominance in industries of the future. Um, specifically, we were talking about AI, um, robotics, advanced manufacturing, 5G uh, technology, um, and quantum. And you think about something like quantum, for example, we are so early. The number of jobs that are created, mm. we can't even envision the industries that will be built. You know, there's always the famous example about um, the advent of the ATM machine and the fear that it would put bankers and tellers out of business. Well, they gravitated into new and different um, and, and ultimately more fulfilling jobs. Um, and, and the industry has exploded in terms of the number of employees. So We actually are past peak bank teller in the US, though. The number of jobs is going down now. Oh, yeah. We but, finally got yeah. there. <laughs> we finally moving it It took a while, right? How long? But I think, I, I think that we will, innovation, I believe is always a net positive, but there will be disruption and it's our job to ensure um, the smoothest and um, the swiftest transition um, for those that are affected. And those that are affected, um, those that are most vulnerable are those with the least amount of skills. When you think about the fact that as a society, both the federal government, but also um, the private sector spends less on workforce development after the age of 22 than any country in the developed world mm -hmm. other than Mexico, less. So we are making all of our investment in terms of skills training as a country historically. We've been making it in those with specialized degrees or um, you know, graduate degrees, think, but we're not investing in the worker that's the most vulnerable, and that's what we need to change, the private sector and, and the government. I this get, this gets to a great question that we got from the audience, which, Doug, I want to throw to you exactly to this point. The question says there's a lot of concern about the growing divide between rural and urban America. Mm -hmm. How do we help individuals in rural America take advantage of mm -hmm. these phenomena that we're talking about? You're a huge employer mm -hmm. in, in exactly these communities that are being left behind. What, can, how, yeah, what would help most? Is that very much relates to the point that Ivanka just made about disruption. We are going to go through a period of greater disruption and as leaders we have a responsibility to communicate, explain to everyone what is happening and what the path is for them to work their way through it, for them and their family. So here is the open door, here's the opportunity for you to step through and if you'll take these training courses, expose yourself in this manner to learning something new, actually being a curious lifelong learner for as many people as possible then I think we can help lead people through this change. But it's gonna take communication, it's gonna take training programs, it's gonna take investment. Um, we just created this opportunity with Guild to do college education for basically a dollar a day, working with a small group of universities, including the University of Florida. And so far in our own training academies, we've been able to have about $210 million worth of portable education that they can now take 
towards a two-year and four-year degree. I think all of these pieces have got to be put in place, and then we need to explain to everyone, here's what's happening, here's the opportunity for you, and as a private sector um, player in this equation, we can really help make this transition happen, but we do have to all work together. Yeah, what, that's what, what I was going to prioritize. Let me ask one final, quick final. What grade would you give us so far as a public-private partnership at doing uh, exactly what you said? Um, a D. Wow. I think we got a lot of opportunity, and there's a lot of change coming. As, as Jenny said earlier, virtually every job is going to change, and we're on the front end of this. These technologies that Ivanka mentioned just a minute ago are going to bring more change in the next five years and ten years. These are not things that are 20 years from now. That it's much greater in, than the change we've seen in the last five. Are so you we as need harsh to come together and stuff. No, uh, well, I'm not quite as harsh or greater. Uh, only, but I do think that it is not an issue of will. It is an, an issue of organization and yes. scale. Because yeah. we are watching this already, and this is partly why we've all been so active in the BRT. Um, you can't have a country with all the skills on two sides. Yeah. You cannot do that. And so, therefore, the whole middle of our country, as we go build these, and you go. 500 companies, we start, instead of doing individual efforts, which is what we've been trying to do, is now aggregate these efforts so we can scale them. And as an example, with these schools, 500 companies have pulled these high schools underprivileged areas yep. and gone to the most underprivileged in the middle of the country, 200 high schools, a pipeline of 125,000 kids now coming through in those areas. That's why I feel maybe it's a, a D of what's been accomplished at the moment, <laughs> no, I, but what we can accomplish, I, I know we all have high confidence. Yeah, let's talk a little about this a little bit more. I, mean, I think we are, as leaders, seeing things and understanding things and starting to put things in place. But if you look at what's happening in the country, how people feel, the divide right. they feel, yeah. populism, things, we have to they're that. uncomfortable. Will my child's future be better than mine? Am I going to be okay? They don't know right. the answers, the solutions. They just have concerns and questions too often. I'm talking about middle America in yep, particular. I agree. We've got to help lead them through that process. And, and I think the communications element is, is incredibly important because of course, if you're in an industry that's constantly being talked about as an industry that's going to be automated within the next decade, how could you not feel tremendous anxiety? Um, and that anxiety permeates communities. And so I think uh, a big part of this is, um, is communicating what our strategy is. And, and that's why creating a national council for the American worker for the first time that takes this all of government approach to say it's our obligation to be thinking about skills development, um, vocational education, lifelong learning from birth through retirement and work with the private sector to do the things we don't do as well, doing specific job training for specific jobs, um, but then help take our data and scale it. Even at the federal government, you think about something like cybersecurity jobs. Well, it's right. really hard to fill a cybersecurity job anywhere in any industry, um, including in the federal government. We have the country's largest workforce. Um, Doug is, is small, a little bit of a, the, I, the largest private employer. So, so the combination of that, but what skills do we have, um, clerical skills that we think will become obsolete over time, and can we start to begin to, to reskill those workers in the federal workforce with skills in cyber that we so desperately need? So we've launched a gear challenge. We're working with the private sector to do that using our own workforce and, um, and uh, trying to lead by example on this front. Ivanka, even among friends, there can be disagreements. And the Business Roundtable sent the White House a letter in August of this year saying that some of the immigration policies that were in place or were being contemplated were not only bad for the people involved, but were bad for business among the Business Roundtable companies. Uh, how was that letter received? Well, I think that, generally speaking, we need to overhaul immigration and ensure that we're able to have a merit-based system where we're able to bring people into this country to fill jobs that can't otherwise be filled by Americans. But I view these as complementary discussions, but um, it's not an either or. We still have to be thinking about the six plus million unemployed Americans. We still have to be thinking about the fact that for a developed nation, we have a pretty low labor force participation rate of able-bodied working, of able-bodied Americans who, for reasons such as addiction to opioids um, or, or other reasons, are outside of the system. So I don't view them as, um, I view them as important to be 
conversations to have in tandem. But you know, we have an existing population of workers we need to make sure are pre prepared, and then we obviously have to supplement that with thoughtful immigration reforms that enable us to um, attract the best talent to this country and then keep that talent within the country um, for example, after receiving an education, we want people to start their businesses in the United States, not move to start them elsewhere. We're almost out of time, so a lightning round final question for Plus you. Plus access to markets, sorry, because we <laughs> spoke about this today. That. It's yeah, really, did. really important, but the president's negotiations on trade and creating greater access for American companies to foreign markets and leveling the playing field is critical because that's gonna create growth, that's gonna create jobs, that's gonna create opportunities here domestically. And with that, we don't have time for my lightning round final Sorry. question, which is a darn shame. But thank you, this has been fantastic. I learned a bunch. Thank you all so much. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain in your seats. Our next panel will begin momentarily. Thank you.